how everybody uses the terms values and culture. You know, values is kind of a statement of what's supposed to be important around here, uh, and it's usually kind of the something that's very well crafted, something that people take a lot of time with, and something that is the ideal that people really want to aspire to. Um, it's what's important, but also by implication, what's not important. And if it works, it's kind of a guide to inform the tactical and strategic decisions that the company is involved with. Culture, on the other hand, is the character of the organization. Uh, it's what everybody knows about how things get done and what's important. And they're not necessarily the same. The culture is pervasive in every nook and cranny of work life. Uh, you know, the values is usually either on a, on a, inside a picture frame in the lobby or sitting on a coffee mug on the table. But culture is actually what happens every day. Uh, values is talking the talk and culture is walking the walk. Uh, and uh, when they're inconsistent with each other, of course, everybody gets very cynical about what's in the value statement. Um, I think when you talk about culture, uh, that the buck stops here. It, culture flows from the top down. Culture flows from the CEO down. It has to do with all the decisions that get made from day to day, uh, which is an expression of values in the company. How the organization works, the process is really an example to people as they go forward. The character of the people involved, the personality of the people involved. Uh, I speak to that, you know, when the CEO is a kind of a, you know, subdued, kind of pessimistic, down kind of person. It kind of permeates the organization and becomes part of the culture. Same is true when they're kind of optimistic or even reckless sometimes, yeah? Um, a new CEO equals a new culture. Think back in your experience. I don't know if you, any of you have experienced an environment where the CEO changed in an organization. When the CEO changes, the culture changes on the same day. Uh, if the cultures are very close, sometimes it's hard to see. But if the, if the CEOs are very different, the cultures change very sharply on the first day. You know, everybody, everybody comes to work, they look at the new person running the company, uh, and they start saying, well, what are the signals I'm getting, and how are things done around here, and what's important, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, you know, culture is kind of the result of the leadership and the style and the character of the person involved in the company. Um, I think that the kind of the the meta message, the message that I kind of like to think about uh, in terms of leadership is the difference between proprietorship and stewardship. Proprietorship is, uh, I believe these are very fundamental, these are very kind of pervasive fundamental issue, issues of leadership style. Proprietorship is about me and about what you can do for me today. It's my company, I own this thing, you know, it's I'm doing this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Stewardship is about us and about what we can build together for the future. And stewardship has that, that kind, of, kind of implication of somebody coming you know, beyond you rather than it kind of living and dying with you. Uh, so I think so stewardship is really kind of my view of what great leadership is about. It's about this mental set on the part of the leader that this is, a, this is an exercise in stewardship rather than leadership. So given that brief introduction, uh, let me kind of jump into what I think are the issues of leadership. Uh, it's, this is, um, and I should kind of put it in the context of, as I uh, was the CEO of Veritas for, I was actually a CEO from 1980 through, uh, through the year 2000. I was a CEO for 20 years. And uh, as I kind of progressed in the job, you know, the first time I had the job of CEO, I was kind of like, well, I see. I, I remember what CEOs were like in my past. I'll do the things that I liked that they did, and I'll and I'll do differently the things I didn't like that they did. And my and my kind of idea of leadership at that time was kind of leadership experience prime. It's everything I experienced, you know, kind of plus my variation thereof. Well, 20 years is a long time. It gives you an opportunity to do a lot of thinking about things. And certainly, as Veritas grew, uh, leadership change is different. You know, being the leader of 25 people than it is, you know, 2,500 people. Uh, and I would say I spent a great deal of time thinking about this. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I'm very proud, actually, of not only what we did as a company in terms of results, but I'm actually very proud when, you know, my, I have children that live in the area, adult children that live in the area, and whenever they run into someone, that, you know, from Veritas when I was there, it's a great company, great management, great leadership, not political, you know, a happy place for people to work. And that's kind of, when they hear that, that makes me happy and proud, right? I mean, so, so that's kind of the, was the end result of that. So let me talk about this. The first thing I have here is a view of leadership from Charles de Gaulle, 
when I want to know what France thinks, I question myself. And I would kind of put that in the category of not something that we, is consistent with the style we want. Um, on the other hand, if I look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, Taoism, Lao Tzu, a leader is best when people barely know that he exists. When his work is done, his aim is fulfilled, they will all say, we did it ourselves. And those are, I mean, I kind of went through all these little quotes that you have in, you know, these, uh, these leadership, in these quote books, you know, and look, these were the two, the, the opposite extreme, if I could describe it that way. So let me talk about, you know, some of the issues that I uh, experienced. Uh, be visible and be invisible. Um, it's an interesting thing that uh, a large part of, of being a leader is being visible to the people around you. That, uh, you know, there's an old, uh, we haven't, it's not, in the, it's not in the vernacular anymore, but they used to always say at HP, the management styles, it was MBWA, management by walking around. So you go out and you talk to people and uh, you make sure that, that they see you and you see them. Uh, in addition to interpersonal meetings, there's a lot of public meetings. There's a lot of, there's a lot of very visible things you do as a manager. Um, I think it's important to be accessible. I remember when, you know, at Veritas, when we, we built our building, I said, you know, they said, where do you want your office to be? And I said, well, you build, you lay out the whole building in you know, our first building. You lay out the whole building, and I'll tell you where I want to go. And they laid out the whole building, and I said, okay, so this location here, which is, you know, near the conference rooms and the coffee stops and the, and the stairs and... This is a place where you're going to have the maximum amount of public traffic. I'll put my office right there with glass walls on it. And no, I didn't have an assistant for many years, so people would walk by and they'd see me and my door was open and they'd walk in and I'd say, how are things going and whatever they were doing. And, and it was just every day I probably saw, you know, 30 people just to kind of in, just, just when I was doing work in my office. Um, it, be invisible. And the invisible part is the interesting part. It's the real work of leadership is done behind the scenes and out of sight and, and, and often alone. Uh, I think that leadership, my definition of leadership, is creating an environment where people can independently apply their intellect, judgment, and energy to advance the vision and goals of the organization and to achieve a personal sense of accomplishment of their work. So that's kind of what I describe as, the, as what leadership is. And the, in red it says creating the environment. So you have to sit down and think about, you know, every day and, you know, and the actions you take every day. Well, does this create the environment that meets those goals or does it not? And that's the work that's not visible to anybody. And that's the work that's actually very difficult. It's, you know, when I take this action, when I do this, when I make this decision, when I whatever, does it further, further these things? Does it create an environment where you get great people to come uh, where they use their intellect, their judgment, their capability. That's what you're hiring them for. They forward the mission, uh, and, and they get a sense of accomplishment and share, I get a shared sense of ownership in the outcome. This is a very, very difficult thing to do. If you think about how you create an environment, it's a, it's a very amorphous, very difficult, it's very, you know, there aren't like 14 steps that you can go put one in front of the other and say, there's your answer. Um, it's not management. Management is accomplishing complex tasks through others. This really has nothing to do with that. This says that when you have all these managers working for you, they work correctly, consistent with that environment. Um, glamorous is the opposite of leadership. Um, I think that uh, it, it's, you know, it's not about me. There's a lot of things you do that are glamorous in the business, uh, but as a leader, you're actually always thinking of others and putting them first. Uh, you know, you can be a comrade to your followers, but you can never be one of them. I always like the, you know, the Henry V, uh, you know, Shakespeare, when he kind of goes out and walks among the troops before this great uh, battle that they're going into, you know, and you sense his, his you know, although he can go to talk to these people, you sense how, how apart he is from, you know, from everybody uh, involved there. Um, when you're doing glamorous things, you're just doing your job on this team. It's an interesting thing. I was, you know, uh, in, in Veritas, I was a public company. I was always on CNN after earnings announcement, as most CEOs are of, of companies that are interested in the public. Uh, and I used to, you know, used, I don't know, it, it seems more glamorous than it is, but I, I used to get up and uh, they used to have us on like around, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning. So I had to get up at like 3.30, you know get dressed and everything, and it was oftentimes actually on Stanford campus or down Mountain View, and you go into this little black room and uh, just one person over there, and you're on CNN, you know, and all these people call you, you know, all these people that, you're, that you knew from third grade. Hey, I saw you on TV, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, it's easy to get carried away with, you know, that, hey, I'm a, you know, 
a little, you know, 15-minute celebrity, right? And I used to think about that and put it in the context of, you know, me doing this the, right now is really no different than the programmer that's sitting in his office 3 o'clock in the morning by himself working on something. It's the same thing. I'm just doing my thing for the company. He's doing his thing for the company. And that uh, kind of perception of it, that kind of, you know, kind of view of things, I think, is, is kind of takes the glamour. It takes it, makes you understand that you're all part of a team. You're just doing the thing that you do for the team rather than not. Uh, warning of danger. Uh, this is a warning. Glamour is seductive. It's seductive. It's easy to, you know, you get invited to banker conferences and you go to Davos and, you know, you start thinking you're a real celebrity. And I'm telling you, it's very seductive and it's very, very hard to kind of keep your sense of yourself about you as a, uh, some humility and some kind of, I'm the same as everybody else. It's very seductive. So, um, if you're loyal to one, you're loyal to none. Uh, a leader has to be loyal to the mission above all else. You can't really have friends and favorites inside the company. It is one of the things that kind of makes you more alone than other people in the organization. You are responsible for the well-being of all the people, uh, and you're the keeper of fairness and equity in the organization. If you have favorites, if you express biases towards certain people and against other people in a in a personal way, it is it's something that is very distorting and very bad for the organization. Uh, I had an interesting, you know, kind of interesting way that I used to think about this, that uh, the guy who built Veritas with me, a person who I'm extremely close to, you know, we you build a company like that together with someone and you, you build great bonds with them. Um, there is not a doubt in my mind that if he was not doing the right thing for the company that I would ask him to leave. There's not a doubt in my mind that if uh, I was not doing the right thing for the company, he would go to the board and get me removed. And because of our value system, neither one of us would have it any other way. We, we both were very much in, in line with this idea that you do the right thing for the organization above all else, and as long as everybody's pulling their weight, that's, 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 that's fine. And if they're not, you go make the changes you have to. It also goes to, um, you know, to the extent that you, as I said, you know, everything starts from the top down. To the extent that you have favorites and you create a political environment, I promise you it'll go through the organization. Other people will kind of have favorites as well, and it'll, it'll kind of uh, infect the organization. Um, the further you are from the problem, the less you know about it. Um, trust those on the front lines. They really do know more than the people back home at the home office. The first line manager knows less about the specifics, and the next manager knows even less. And you know, when you get to the top, which we all ascribe to, you really don't know anything about anything. And that's true. You, you have no knowledge. You know, and I, you know, we used to talk about you're in a company, you, you have a customer situation. It's the salesman and the first line manager that know what's going on there. That, you know, you can sit and hypothesize and make things up in your mind, but you really have no idea what's really going on on the front lines and the development organizations and the finance organizations. So you really don't know anything about anything more. So uh, what you really want to do is you want to trade your situational knowledge, which is now at zero for judgment, experience, and perspective. And what we used to do at Veritas whenever we had to make decisions, we used to get the people who knew what was going on involved in the decision. So if we had a customer decision, we would get the sales rep uh, on the phone in a conference call if it was like a big corporate decision about a deal or something like that. Uh, for two reasons. One, we want his information. And number two, we want to know how he feels about living with the outcome. And we want to get him engaged in this. And people really had a, you know, a sense of it being, uh, of them being able to control the things that were, had, had input into the things that were important to them. It was a very important, you know, kind of dimension of the company. Um, the higher up you get, the fewer decisions you should make. Um, so everyone offers you a decision. I, I, I have to tell you, you know, I, I remember that little public space I described where I used to sit. Well, one of the things that happened is that people used to come in all day long and ask me, you know, should we do A or B? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, they'd come in and they'd say, we're having a Christmas party. We can't decide whether we ought to have a parfait or a pastry for dessert. I, so, look, I'm not, I, you know, it's funny, but I'm telling you, it's what goes on. They walk into your office and say, you know, we, we don't know, you know, we kind of have this discussion, should we have a parfait or, dessert, or, a, or a pastry for dessert? Uh, that's the kind of the, the trivial example. But there's lots of other examples that seem more sophisticated but are, in fact, equally trivial. 
so what you want to do is you want to say, what's the impact of this decision? You know, have the people involved thought about it? Are they more or less in the right quadrant? Uh, and what's the downside here? And you know, the very, very large majority of decisions in an organization uh, have been thought about. They are more or less in the right quadrant, and the downside is not great. The large majority, the you know, 95% or something like this, a very, very, very large number. Uh, and you know, allowing others to make the decision has real meaning to them. So they come in and they ask me for the dessert, you know, and I say, well, you know, you guys are planning this whole thing, you know, what do you think? And they kind of say, well, da 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 And I say, you know, why don't you guys decide what you want to do? Uh, you, you, you sound completely competent. You're more thoughtful about, thoughtful about this than I am. And you don't have to come and tell me the answer. You don't have to report back to me, you know. And people like that. You know, they kind of walk out of my office. They got a little spring in their step. They're kind of an inch taller. And they go home and they tell their spouse, yeah, you know, I went into the CEO. And he said, you make the decision, right? You know, people like that. And it's an important ingredient in getting them engaged in the company. And it teaches them how to make decisions. And it teaches them to not be afraid to make decisions. You can't, when you run a large organization, you can't make decisions for everybody. You have to get people to make decisions. And you have to get them to make good ones. So, um, you know, this is a... You know, the fewer decisions you make, the better it is. And, and, and it do, it's not an abrogation of your job. You know, the, the idea of the CEO kind of sitting at the command console and making decisions and pressing, but it's, it's not the way you build the culture. It's, you know, it's the way you micromanage. And, you know, who wants to work in a place like that? Um, the more power you give away, the more you have. Um, the, you empower individuals by giving them knowledge, authority, and an acceptable margin of error. Um, what I know that you don't know makes me more powerful than you. So what you want to do is you want to level that playing field. Um, a leader has the power to do this. A leader has the power to take the information that is in organizations tends to be you know, held at higher and higher levels and tell everybody. You, know, you can tell people more than you think you can. Uh, let me give an example of this. Um, but, and, it, and it diminishes the, politi the politicization of the organization. Let me give an example of giving away power and, uh, uh, and, and kind of the results of it. We had in, in um, early in Veritas, we had a problem where we're sitting around the executive staff meeting. We said, you know, we really have too many shares. We have, you know, a capital structure. We had, you know, a company of 25 people and we had 30 million shares outstanding. We had more millions of shares than we had employees. It's not a good thing. Uh, we hire people, we give them stock options, we give them these big numbers, and someday we're going to pull a rug out from under them because we're going to reverse split this stock. And it doesn't feel good to me. You know, it doesn't feel like, a, you know, like we're kind of having a straight deal. So you know, we talked about this at the uh, staff meeting, and the, 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 kind of the thought was, well, why don't we do a three-for-one reverse split? And then you know, all, the, all the pushback was, you know, oh, yeah, everybody's going to be demoralized. Everybody's going to hate management. They're going to think they're getting screwed and all this other stuff. So I said, well, listen, why don't we just give them all the information and let them make the decision? Now, I don't know how many companies you know that would go to the employee base and say, do you think we ought to reverse split the stock? But I can't think of any besides, you know, my story over here. So we go to the employee base. It looked, you know, not a lot different than this. It wasn't tiered up, but it was about the same number of people. I walked in a room holding a $10 bill. And I said, does anybody have two fives? Of course, everybody's very suspicious at this point in time because they don't know what's happening. Uh, nobody gives me, I said, come on, does anybody have two fives? So we kind of found somebody to do a little, you know, uh, change for 10. And I said, before you put it away, would you mind if we exchanged it back? And they said, no. I said, so you're kind of indifferent whether you have one 10 or two fives? And they say, yeah. And I said, great, we're here to discuss a reverse split today, <laughs> uh, which is a completely perfect analogy to that. Uh, so I said, look, we think that it's a problem that we have too many shares outstanding and we hire people and we give them, you know, this kind of improper information. I don't care because I do the math. I kind of do the, I do things in percentages, so it makes no difference to me whether we have 3 million shares or 300 million shares. Uh, I said, but most employees come in and they say, well, if I get so many shares times $100, this is what it's going to be worth someday in the future, right? Uh, so we think we ought to kind of, for the sake of being, you know, it's going to happen eventually. We think we ought to do it sooner rather than later. And so, and then I said, but you know what? Since you guys seem to care about this a lot, we're going to let you make the decision. Anything you want to do is okay with us. So we gave them a lot of information. We spent a lot of time talking. Uh, they had a lot of questions. You know, we kind of went on and on. I, my, my experience from that was that, that, that 
software, nothing software engineers like more than software except financial engineering. Love financial engineering. Love talking about stock options. So we did all this other stuff, you know, and, uh, and they're very sophisticated. Uh, so we did all this, and I said, you know, we're not ready to make a decision. Why don't we kind of chew on this for a week instead of working, and we'll kind of meet up here next week and make a decision. So they kind of, you know, had a parade of people in my office asking questions, and a week later they voted. The, the big objection they had was, well, if we hire someone new and our stock option is smaller than someone else's, won't we lose that person? And I said, well, you will unless you explain what you now know so they can go ask the right questions to the other company. And if, they, and if, and if we're the ones that, that educate them and give them this understanding, in fact, we will have the credibility and trust. Uh, they all kind of nodded their head and voted unanimously to do it. It was a very interesting experience because the management team didn't want to do this. Uh, the management team thought we should not give them, you know, the kind of offer them this decision. Uh, uh, two things that came out of it were very interesting. One that came out of it was um, we came, you know, we, the conclusion was is that these people, when you give them all the information, actually come to the right conclusion for the right reasons, which was, you know, a great thing to experience. Uh, and from the employee point of view, I can assure you, and you can probably relate to this, that if we had came into the room and given them exactly the same information in exactly the same amount of detail, and then we told them that this is a decision management was making. Every single one of them would have walked out and said, there's something I don't know, there's something they're not telling me, and I'm getting screwed here. And this way they walked out saying, you know, I like this, it's a fair deal, I have all the information and I had control of this thing. So I really believe you give away information and you know, the more power you give away, the more you have. Those people become loyal. Those people become, uh, they enhance the ability of the company to do things. And I think it actually accrues to the power of the leadership, uh, power in the, in the positive sense. Empowered individuals be loyal to the company and loyal to the leadership. Um, okay, so uh, know thyself. Uh, we all want to know everything and be best at everything. Uh, it's a hallmark of great leaders that they know their strengths, weaknesses, likes, and dislikes. Uh, I would suggest that you want to augment your weaknesses with other people's strengths. Uh, you want to be able to, first of all, do a fair inventory, but you want to go... You know, the things that you're not good at, hire people who are better at it, way better at it than you are, and give them the opportunity to do that. Possible find others to do the things you don't like. We all have things we don't like to do. You know, I, I'm completely capable of sitting in a meeting doing an operations review on action items, you know, meeting every Monday morning for three hours to do that. But I got to tell you, it, to me, it feels like someone's sticking toothpicks under my fingernails. It's very painful for me to do that. So I don't do that. So I run a company, I hire people to go, who like to do that. There's people who love doing this stuff, right? Uh, so I hire people to go do the things I don't like to do. Uh, check to see if your self-assessment is, uh, is shared by others. Trust and you will be trusted. Uh, I, I, it's, this is a, again, this is a more of a demeanor uh, than it is a um, uh, kind of a, a, a mechanism. So the first level of trust is based on fair play that is visibly exercised. So fair play is how do you compensate people, how do you promote people, how do the processes of the companies work. But great leadership comes from a deep sense of trust between the leader and the led. As a leader, I believe you have to trust first. I believe you have to express trust before you can expect to be trusted. Uh, you may occasionally get disappointed, but I think the payoff is far greater than the cost. Trust is giving people information. Trust is saying, uh, you know, this is information that's confidential to the company, and we share it with you because you're a part of the company, and we expect you not to share it with other people. And occasionally you get disappointed, but I think that the that the, the take is much, but much, much, much greater than the give in that situation. Um, confront issues directly, but be thoughtful, gracious, and caring. Uh, there are a lot of difficult things you do when you you know run any kind of large organization. You have to fire people. You have to negotiate very difficult deals. You have to you know, go after competition, whatever. Uh, sometimes you have to do a riff. Uh, I think it's important to do all things with caring and grace. I think it's really important to treat people with dignity uh, and uh, each person you meet and, and to kind of have that as a stylistic thing to do. Is there's nothing, whatever it is you're doing, there's nothing, you know, there's really nothing personal here. And it really behooves you to kind of be as I say, gracious, caring, uh, and a kind person in, in the things you do. Uh, and, you know, for, the, for those of you who want to have a, a reason for, a, a non-altruistic reason for doing it, uh, you never know where you're going to meet these guys again. So uh, I, I learned this, I uh, had a little personal experience as a young sales manager 
I uh, was interviewing this guy, and uh, you know, five minutes into the interview, it was clear that this guy was like a turkey, right? So, um, you know, being uncaring and ungracious, I proceeded to let him know that in the interview by asking him questions that I knew he couldn't answer. It was really an awful experience. Um, and uh, so I kind of didn't think much about it. We ended up, I, you know, cut the interview short as I could and left the room. And about two weeks later, uh, he shows up at one of my customers as the VP of sales. It was just awful. It was just an awful experience. So you never know when you're going to run into these people again. I have, uh, in my career, uh, in, in, in these kinds of things, and uh, for business reasons, for the right business reasons, I have a friend who I hired uh, and fired, and then three years later, hired and fired. You know, it's a long story, no good reasons, but you know, we're still friends. Uh, because we're able to, to kind of go past those things in a way that, uh, you know, I was went out of my way to be as, as caring and as gracious as I could. Um, the whole truth, uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, uh, one of my favorites here. Um, a key job of management is to fix broken stuff. Uh, if you don't know what's broken, you can't fix it, and everybody wants to tell you what they think you want to hear, what they think you want to hear. They think you want to hear good news and happy happiness. Uh, and in a way that will make them look good. So here's the great news, and I'm the guy that, that's bringing it to you. Um, you have to find a way to convince people that you need to know the truth. And if you can't convince people of this, you're not going to know the truth. Um, and you have to always honor the message, messenger of this. You have to, when people come and tell you something that's you know, a disaster going on, thank you for telling me this is the, something that is really important for this company to know, and I, now I can act on it. And you have to really kind of give them a sense of, having done a good deed for doing this. I have a great story. Uh, you guys like stories? Yeah, OK. So I have a great story that goes with this. Um, in 1999, uh, Veritas had prior, prior you know, a year, uh, a year and a half early entered the backup business. But by 1999, Veritas and Legato were locked in a head-to-head -head battle on every backup deal in the marketplace. And it was, you know, it's just, it was a, it was a two company, uh, you know, kind of brutal, you've seen this before, two companies, every single deal, both have kind of, you know, great offerings, you know, they're a little different, and, you know, everything like, but it's like everybody in, you know, in Veritas is crush Legato, and everybody in Legato is crush Veritas. It was, you know, just one of those kind of head to head things. So naturally, at the end of the first quarter, I, I called up the, uh, not naturally, but you know, at the end of the first quarter, I called up our sales department. I said, I want an inventory of every single deal that we went head to head with Legato. I want to know who won the deal, and I want to know how much, how much money changed hands on the deal. You know, because they know what happened. If they lose a deal because of a discount, they usually know. So we kind of tally all that up, and uh, I look at all the numbers, and uh, we had made our quarter. I look at all the numbers, and I said, I think they missed a quarter. You know, could I? You know, I, I had all the data, right? I think I had all the data. Um, so I called up my board, and I sent an email out to my board. I said, you know, I think they missed a the quarter. And uh, sure enough, they announced a the quarter. Everything's hunky-dory. Quarter two, we go through the same, you know, the same exercise. We look at the stuff. Quarter three, the same exercise. I'm sitting there saying, like, are they selling this stuff on Jupiter? I can't figure out where they're selling this stuff. I have no idea what's going on. Quarter four uh, comes along, same thing happens. We kind of tally up all the stuff and we say, look, they, they have to miss their quarter. Quarter four comes along, they say, um, we're not ready to announce yet. We have some accounting issues that we have to go through. And we think we missed quarter four. And two weeks later, they said, yes, we missed quarter four. Actually, we missed quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three also. And the question is, is how come I knew the CEO, I know the CEO of that company is a good guy. How come I know and he didn't know? Well, he didn't know because he didn't ask the questions and he didn't kind of build the clarity of communications in the organization. I remember, you know, we actually tried to merge with this company a number of years ago. I remember always going over to his office and I would go into his office and I'd go into the executive section and then I'd go into the back of the executive section and I'd go past his, his assistant and I'd finally get to this little corner office that, you know, probably nobody had ever been into besides him. He was a guy that really isolated himself from the organization, and that's the price he paid. It was a very, you know, it was, it was a very, you know, different, I mean, new management, you know, board had to change everything. It was really an awful situation. But it is the perfect example of, you know, 
let's hear the bad news sooner rather than later. If they had, if they had known in Q1 what was going on and they had announced it and remediated it, nobody would have gotten fired. You know, things happen, you miss a quarter occasionally. And they would have been able to go rebuild from there. So the consequences were really dire in that situation. Um, listen to everyone, but trust your own judgment. Uh, you know, that may sound a little bit in conflict with some of the things I say, but, you know, there's kind of a principle of, of um, you know, you do have experience, you do have common sense when you kind of listen to a lot of things and they kind of don't seem to make sense to you, they probably are not sensible. So you kind of have to kind of, as, you, as, the, as the world passes by, as this kind of stream of information and decisions and process goes by, you have to kind of keep yourself grounded in kind of sensibility. Uh, be open, be genuinely open, listen constructively, learn. I think you want to hold your opinions close to yourself, you know, hold your opinions in abeyance and not kind of jump to conclusions. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you have to trust your own judgment. Uh, mostly, if you do a great job of building a great organization and giving them, you know, that creating that environment I talked about, mostly what's going on is going to be consistent with your judgment. So it's really not a problem. But there are times uh, when you have to kind of step away and say, you know, doesn't make sense. Maybe we ought to, we ought to think about this a different way. Um, there's life after death. Uh, you know, every company, uh, particularly entrepreneurial companies, uh, will have black days. And I mean black days that are so black that you think that there is no tomorrow, that you think you have, you, you look death in the face. Anybody in a small company here? <laughs> Anybody have a black day so far? Yeah. Every company has black days. Uh, they are awful. I mean, they are uh, psychologically, they are, you know, you have a knot in your stomach. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just an awful thing to experience. But it's part of the, part of the deal. Um, everyone, as the leader of the company, will be looking at you. Uh, and, you know, you need to communicate candidly uh, and directly. Be calm and show them a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Focus on the things you can do to make a difference. And mostly the opportunity here is overcome adversity. Overcoming adversity together builds, forges teamwork and trust. And I have a story. It's a good story. We'll do another story. I think we have time. Yeah. Um, so uh, Veritas was um, Veritas was at uh, went public in December of 1993. Uh, it's actually what today would be considered a micro IPO. The, we raised $16 million in the IPO and the company's market cap when we were done was $64 million. So that would be a nano IPO, actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, and, we had, and, and, and the year prior, we had finished $10 million at profitable, profitable operations. So we had four quarters of profitability. It was a very solid company, but small. Um, so we went public, uh, and uh, that's December of 1993, and we're in... Uh, first quarter of 1994, probably around two-thirds through the quarter. And the quarter is about, you know, a little over $2 million. We did $10 million the year before, and it's kind of fourth quarter loaded. So $10 million, uh, about $2, $2.2 million in a quarter. And uh, I'm away at Point Reyes with my wife and my um, uh, aunt and uncle who are in from out of town. And I'm up there, you know, and uh, I'm checking my, you know, I have my cell phone with me. Uh, I'm checking my, you know, checking all the time, and I get this message at around 11 o'clock that this deal we have with Mentor Graphics for $300,000, they call us up and say they're, they're canceling the deal and they're shutting down the project. And this was a deal that, you know, we had had, we had probably worked on, uh, we were doing some custom work for it, probably work on this thing for like, you know, 15 months. Uh, so 300000 out of, you know, 2.2, do the math, right? There's no way we can make the quarter. This is Friday afternoon. Um, so, some of you will be able to relate to this. So, so here it is, 11 o'clock. I'm out. I can't. I can't leave these guys. My wife and my my aunt and uncle. Uh, I have nothing I can do except you know call in every five minutes to see if there's any more news, which of course there isn't. Uh, I have this knot in my stomach, and I spend the rest of the day. I'm in a silent movie. They're all talking to each other. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. I have. Could I'm sitting there, you know, dwelling on this thing, you know, and. Uh, it's awful, right? Uh, and, you know, the, the great news, and this is really a, a, a kind of a, a moment for me where I really learned something. The great news was it was Friday afternoon and I was out of the office and I didn't have time to react. So I had, time, had an opportunity to think about it. And I went home and thought about it over the weekend. And, um, and, uh, and I thought about the fact that, you know, it's more important, what, the, the outcome of the process is less important 
the outcome is less important than the process. What, uh, what we do as a company and how we deal with this adversity is more important than whether we miss the quarter or not, interestingly enough. That's a hard thing to kind of figure, you know, when you're staring in the face of this blackness, it's hard to figure, it's hard to do this. So I walk in in the morning, you know, I go to the staff meeting. It's a small company. I don't know, we got 50 people in the company. Nothing travels faster than bad news. Everybody knows. Uh, I walk in, there's all these, you know, everybody, everybody's, who are they looking at? They're looking at me, right? So everybody walks in, they're looking at me. We go to staff meeting, uh, and <laughs> it's really bleak. Uh, and I said, you know, so, uh, so look, I said, uh, this is a disaster. This is a catastrophe. This is awful. I said, you know, this is just uh, as black a day as we can have. Um, I said, now, it turns out we deserve to get this canceled because we did a terrible job on this project. And, you know, all along it was problematic, and they actually made the right decision to cancel this thing. Um, and it's, it's really good to speak truth in a meeting like this. Everybody knew that was the truth, but, you know. And I said, so we'd have to do a post-mortem on this. We have to figure out how we messed up and what the issues are. I said, but I think if we do it right now, we're going to be very emotional, and, I don't th and we're going to be trying to, you know, fix the blame instead of fix the problem. So I want to put a moratorium on that. And I want to not, not do this, you know, this post-mortem until a month has gone by so that we can all calm down. Everybody thought that was a good idea. And I said, so it looks like we have a $300,000 problem. And uh, this, this deal was with Mentor Graphics up in, uh, up in Portland. And uh, I said, so does anybody have any ideas what we could do? And they were looking at me pretty much the way you're looking at me right now. Nobody had an idea. <laughs> it was kind of a bunch of blank faces, you know. And, uh, and I kind of let that sit for a while. And I raised my hand. And I said, well, I have an idea. And uh, they said, well, great. What's your idea? <laughs> so I said, well, I think what we ought to do is I think we ought to go to Mentor Graphics and we ought to ask them for $100,000. And they said, uh, they just canceled the contract. I said, yeah, no, nah, I know that. I said, but it is a contract. You know, we did more bad things than they did, but they did bad things too, as all contracts, when they kind of come to an end, have bad, you know, bad on both sides. Uh, however, I think we ought to go and say, we do have a contract. We are a small company. We are vulnerable. We just went public. Why don't you guys give us $100,000, and why don't we have a clean walk away from this thing? And everybody kind of sitting and nodding their head, and I turned around to the guy who owned the account, and I said, you know, kind of the executive on the account, and I said, you think you could go convince him of that? And he said, I think I could. And I said, great. You don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> you need to leave here, get on an airplane, go to Portland, and call me when you, after you've spoken to someone, call up and let us know what's going on. So, uh, so he left the room, and now we had a $200,000 problem, which is pretty good. <laughs> I said, anybody else have any ideas? So the, uh, the sales manager said, you know, we've got this deal sitting out in, in uh, London, and um, we probably could, you know, we could probably discount it and bring it into the quarter if we had to. I said, well, who's the, uh, who's the sales guy in that? He said, well, Peter. I said, call Peter in the room. So Peter's a sales rep, but he had no appointments this particular day. So he came into the room, flip-flops, short pants, unshaven, you know, like he was just going to hang around the office and do a little work during the day. It was a very informal company. Um, and uh, so we said, so Peter, um, this deal that we have at ICL, I said, I, said, I said, Peter, you know the problem. He said, yes. I said, this deal that we have at ICL, you think you can pull it into the quarter? He said, I think so. I said, you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> I said, you have your passport with you? He said, I do. I said, why don't you pack up your briefcase, head to the airport, and go to London? And he said, okay. And uh, on his way to the airport, he calls his contact in London. He said, uh, hey, I'm coming in to talk to you guys about a deal. I don't have any place to sleep. I don't have any clothes. I don't have any toiletries. Can you help me out? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, sure. You know, and he went and slept at the guy's house. Uh, and he called me the next day, and you know, we, we ended up doing a 175K deal. So now we had 275. We had 25 to go. And I said, anybody have any ideas? And we, you know, we kind of found some what we call pots and pans, you know, some little pieces of, you know, 5K here and 2K there, and we kind of got over the top. Uh, it was a great experience for the company. Uh, it was an experience where we didn't fix the blame, we fixed the problem. People worked together. We felt, you know, we built trust, we built teamwork, we faced adversity together. It's, it was a great, it was a great experience. And for me, it was an eye-opener. It was the first time, you know, it was not, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't point fingers, you know, you, know you, you look at it as an opportunity. It is a leadership opportunity. You look at it and say, 
you know, there are going to be good days and bad days. When bad days come, what can I do to build more teamwork in the company? What can I do to build more cohesiveness, more sense of overcoming adversity? You don't always come overcome all of it, but you can always do something about it, right? And doing something together makes a difference. It was a great, it was a great personal experience for me. The other side of that is when things are great, remind people there'll be dark days again, because promise you there will be. I mean, there always will be in the future, right? Uh, only those who are both paranoid and courageous will survive. This is kind of um, paraphrased uh, from from uh, Andy Grove, only the paranoid survive. Um, you never know where and how the world might change, uh, and great companies make transformational changes. Uh, you have to put your whole company at risk sometimes in order to save it. Uh, my, it, is, it, is the, it is the character, I believe it's the character that companies, very successful companies kind of go up this slope. Uh, the world changes slowly during that time, and at some point in time, their product or market or whatever it is changes to the point where growth slows down and kind of flattens and then kind of slowly flattens more and then ultimately goes down slowly. And it's easy not to see that. It's easy either not to see that or it's easy to say, well, growth is slowed and, you know, we're a great company and da-da-da-da. Uh, it is the character of transformational. It is the character of great companies that they go up this slope, they flatten out a little bit, and they find a new slope to go up. And they do that by transformation. Uh, and, and I have... Uh, you know, some, some, uh, some stories. Uh, Intel was, you know, since, since Andy Grove's quote, Intel, uh, for those of you who remember long enough, used to be in the memory business with everybody else. The memory business was a, just a tough business in the semiconductor business. But it was said that if you weren't in the memory business, you couldn't keep your process competitive. So everybody had to be in the memory business. And Intel raised their hand one day and said, we're getting out of the memory business. We're going to be only in the processor business. And we're going to keep our process good in the processor business. And everybody said it was a disaster to get out of the memory business. Even though it was a commodity business, they would lose their process. They would lose their edge. And they basically transformed themselves from one among many to the world's leading company, you know, which they had the, the dominance in for decades as a result of that decision. It was a very, very courageous decision. Uh, you know, Microsoft was, a, was, a, was a, an OEM supplier to IBM. They became an OEM supplier to the world in operating systems. They built multiple businesses on top of that. They built their office business. They built their, uh, they built their, uh, their database and, and mail business. They, they have, you know, done a great job of continuing to find new things to build a company over time rather than trying to let one kind of do that. Uh, Sun was a, was, a, was a scientific workstation company and converted themselves into a commercial server company. That's a pretty, pretty far away conversion to get from one to the other. Um, HP, over its history, went from being an instrument company to being a computer company to being a printer company, if you kind of look at, you know, kind of look at the persona of the company. And Oracle went from being a database company to an applications company. It's the great companies that have the ability to kind of go find new things, new markets, new opportunities, and transform the company. And oftentimes, you have to put the company at risk to do that. Um, there are a lot of people who are going to tell you that you're wrong and that these things are too risky uh, and you need the courage to stay the course. Uh, there is no finish line. One of my, one of my, and many of these are favorites of mine. This is one of mine. Building a great company is like building a cathedral. Those who start hopefully will not see its, you know, see its completion. Uh, and each accomplishment is a prelude to the next challenge. So we have, and it kind of goes together with the last slide. The last slide says, you know, you have to go transform yourself. But it kind of speaks to the fact that there is no resting place. You know, when you're running a business in a, in a competitive marketplace, uh, each day you accomplish something, and each day there's a new challenge in front of you. And you have to run fast and be competitive, but there's no place where you can go and rest. And I had this, I used to have this picture in my mind. It's kind of a, um, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's, you know, maybe it's a daydream or whatever. But I used to see myself going, you know, trudging up this, you know, kind of very, very steep uh, mountainous area. And everybody in the company was doing this with me, right? We're all going up there together. And we get to this plateau, this, you know, mesa. And everybody feel great, you know. It's time to rest and time to set up camp and time to, you know, build tents and get water and eat and all these other things. And I get to there, and the only thing I could see is the next mountain. I would kind of look at it and it would fill my eyes. And i turn around to the people around me and I'd say, come on, let's go. And they'd say, no, 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 you can't go because we've got to do all these things. And, you know, we can, we're not prepared. We're not this. We're not that. You know, and there'd be a hundred, you know, objections to this thing. And I'd say, don't worry. Someone will take care of it. Let's go. 
and we kind of head off for the next for the next mountain. And it is the way, you know, that is a metaphor of what I experienced in building this company. Yeah, there's always kind of reasons not to do things, but it's more important to actually go do things. And I always found that there were people that would go clean up after us, you know, and kind of go take everything and make it work correctly and stuff like that. Uh, and not in a casual, not, not in a cavalier way, not, you know, not, not, not that you're leaving messes behind you. Um, an IPO, which in this valley is always thought of as the end point, uh, is not the end point. It's not a harvest. Uh, it's simply one step on the long road. The real value of companies is built after the, after the IPO. So Veritas, when it was an IPO, was a $64 million company. At the height of the bubble, it was a $64 billion company. We had increased the value a thousandfold after the, after the IPO. And it ended up getting sell, sold uh, to Symantec uh, a number of years later uh, at $13.5 billion company. This huge amount, of, so, so regardless of, you know, that kind of the top and the bottom of the, of the value of the company, huge amount of value is built after the IPO. Uh, the IPO was just like a little stepping stone. And I remember when we had our IPO, I called all the employees together and I said, it's like college graduation. It's called commencement. It's the beginning of the opportunity to build a great company, not, not the end of, not the, end of uh, the last accomplishment. Um, the last uh, kind of uh, notation here on advice as a leader it comes from Harry Truman. If you want a friend, buy a dog. <laughs> Here's a picture of my dog, Roxy. <laughs> She's a little older now, but pretty much the same personality. Um, and last, uh, you know, this is kind of values, culture, things of that nature. Uh, I think that uh, building a company with great culture and great values is what it's all about. I think it's what makes things worthwhile. Uh, we spend more time at work than we do in any other single task in our life, in any other single activity in our life. Do the math. How much time do you spend with your wife? How much time do you spend with your children? How much time do you spend with your best, you know, your best hobby, with your sports, whatever it is? You spend more time working. And you know, when you're the CEO of a company, you only work. You know, and it's, it's unfortunate, but there are no such thing as vacations. There's only working in different places because it never leaves your mind, right? Um, so it, it, the, the, the place you work, uh, we spend more time at that activity than anything else in our life. Since the outcome of the efforts is not predictable, the quality of the daily experience is very important. You can't say it's all about you know, only the goal. It's also got to be about how we get there. It's not that the, you know, the means don't justify the end. The means have virtue of their, in their own right. Um, values and culture define the character of the company uh, they permit us to do our work with integrity, uh, to conduct business in a civilized, honest environment, and to do it, uh, to, to recruit the best and the brightest and the principled around us. And I like to work in an environment like that. I like to work in a company where I walk in and I like the quality of people in those companies. Uh, I believe profoundly that they, on the contrary, do not only do not sap the competitiveness of the company, I think they make companies more robust and more enduring and more competitive over time.